Well, it's such a pleasure to be here. I, I, I uh, really was excited about this idea of giving a, a, a talk to the public. Um, I often talk to academic audiences and colleagues, and um, just thinking about uh, how to uh, present ideas clearly, I think, is, a, is an important uh, uh, challenge and opportunity for, for people in academics. Um, so I'm very excited about the prospects for understanding how our minds work. That's my motivation for being in this field of artificial intelligence. Um, the word artificial intelligence is interesting. I often think it, the field should have been called computational intelligence because I'd like to see the questions and answers apply to human minds as well as to the artifacts that we're studying or building. I like to call AI the study of computational mechanisms underlying thought and intelligent behavior. Now, in 1955, when John McCarthy first came up with that phrase, he told me personally, he came up with that phrase to put the flag on the pole of what he meant. Um, and in the 50s, artificial was a very big word, I guess. It meant we're going to create something new that's like humans um, to find how to make machines solve the kinds of problems now reserved for people um, was, was in the proposal. Um, now, the proposal is so well written, I think it could be funded today if it was handed to the NSF for some grant money. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's timeless in some of the questions it's asking, but it called out perception, learning, reasoning, and natural language as four pillars um, of human competency or intelligence. Uh, and since then, we have more than just four pillars. We have a whole set of disciplines and subdisciplines uh, um, within the umbrella of what, I should say the expanding umbrella of what's called artificial intelligence these days. And it's great that some of these meetings and conferences like machine vision typically are much larger these days than even the main AI conference, which is broader in terms of this, its scope and, and number of topics. Now, there's an interesting notion of the perceptions of advances in AI versus the, 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 the reality of the long-term uh, results. We often hear about Watson, and, and the public gets excited watching TV, and Jeopardy's being, being uh, defeated. Uh, sorry, the, the humans playing Jeopardy, the automated driving issues, uh, new kinds of, of avatars, the AlphaGo work, for example. But in reality, there's been a, a constant stream coming out of the AI community, even defined narrowly. So for example, in the um, late 90s, a nice pipeline that actually recognized handwriting, used a language model to back it up and raise the probability of correctness, was put into service with the US Postal Service and now worldwide. And in the US alone, it's handling um, uh, 25 billion letters per year, saving um, hundreds of millions of dollars. And it really just recognizes some of the, the in the rough um, addresses on envelopes. And this is just one of many, many projects um, that you don't really hear about. That you might call these results running under the hood of, of our society, uh, I think we, we care about. Um, there are tremendous opportunities ahead, and, and of course, some already in progress in terms of delivery of possibilities um, for taking lots of data, which is now being becoming more, more so available, and building predictive models that generate probabilities of outcomes that we care about, like, for example, what illnesses are present given a set of symptoms from a patient, or what's the weather going to be like in four days. Um, the, we see a lot of work on predictive models coming up with predictions, much less work on taking the inferences about probabilities into actions or decisions where the rubber meets the road, typically. So it's a very important pipeline at the point of this group. It's like data to predictions to decisions. And it's not just for automation, but it's also to advise people who might want to get an extra boost or a perspective from a machine or from a large data set to build insights in taking action, for example, in a safety critical setting or a high stakes situation. Now, I often say that AI all up, and I mean machine learning, planning algorithms, um, algorithms that do optimization of various kinds, is a sleeping giant for healthcare. Um, I've studied healthcare very carefully, and there are so many places where we can do a great job at saving money while increasing or enhancing the quality of healthcare. As an example, a few years ago, uh, back in 2008, our team fielded a system called Readmissions Manager. It was called RAM. Uh, and it, it, it was, it's been distributed around the world. 
and it's addressing a 35, sorry, $17.5 billion problem, which is caught for the US alone, it's bigger in, in the world, which is preventable readmissions to hospitals within 30 days. People will be discharged and they come back to the hospital sick again. And what this system is doing is looking at many variables in, a, in an electronic health record. And right in the patient's chart, it's using machine learning to put up the probability of readmission within 30 days. And doctors can use this to, to direct their health care and to create new kinds of packages or bundles or monitoring or surveillance, like smart scales, for example, for a certain illness called congestive heart failure. And it's pretty clear that AI methods are in the process of transforming science. And we don't, again, think about this all the time. But if you ask any person in bioinformatics, for example, what kind of tools do they use daily, you'll hear about probabilistic graphical models, um, planning algorithms, optimization of various kinds. Back in 2003, Daphne Kohler and her team worked with biologists at Stanford. And they took the Morse code, I call it the Morse code, of of, of data coming off of, of, of expression of these chips, seeing what cells express. And it's like kind of, you see all these different patterns coming in, what, what are, what, what's DNA doing at any moment? And with graphical models, uh, was able to decode cellular functions, metabolism, into a set of modules with sparse connections between them to get a sense for, uh, it's helping us, it's a new lens on biology. And I have to say that I was floored um, just like four years ago when Sarah Jane Dunn led a team, uh, Microsoft Research in Cambridge, looking at what cells do um, as they go in, in embryogenesis, as they go from stem cells into a final tissue type, and they freeze. Like your skin cell is going to probably stay a skin cell for the rest of your life, and your brain cell stays a neuron. What's, what, what kind of coding goes on that tells a cell when to, how to differentiate and how, when to stop and that's, that's what you become for life, for the life, lifespan of the, of, of the human being. Well, it's a, it's a big, again, a big, uh, you look at, the, at the, the, the codes, the coded patterns on the chips coming out, and they do these time codes during, during this unfurling of an, of, during embryogenesis, the creation of a creature, they can do time stamps and look at what, what cells are, are expressing what to get a sense for the coded messages coming from the cells. But with a theorem prover, right? With, you know, this is like a logical theorem prover um, we're able to figure out that you just needed three inputs to start or st to stop a cell and say stop differentiating now. And it was, this was discovered by a large-scale proof, which I thought was very impressive work. And it has a lot to say about possibilities going forward. Those are just two points of many points of what's happening in science these days. Now in 2009, there was clearly an inflection point in the field of artificial intelligence. When, um, I have to say, we're, 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 we take pride in this. At Microsoft Research, Jeff Hinton was visiting with us and with a, with a small team of folks from Toronto. And we discovered that these neural net algorithms called convolutional neural networks, um, or deep networks for short, deep neural networks, were performing in a mediocre way um, back in the late 80s and early 90s, and therefore, were set to the side, and other algorithms came forward for doing machine learning. But they were performing poorly because they were famished for data. They have a bigger parameter space, and they're just very hungry. And we, now we had large data sets available um, of the form we didn't have handy in those days. And it turns out when you actually um, started a new cycle of innovation around large data sets, we had new kinds of results. So the first thing we worked on in those days was speech recognition, and we noticed a big jump, or actually I should say a jump down in word error recognition rates for a particular data set called the switchboard data set. It's an interesting data set. It's been one of the test sets. You see how, we, how performance has happened for switchboard data over the years here. Um, it's a data set of people talking to other people on low bandwidth telephone lines collected by an unnamed US government agency by volunteers who were told they were doing so and paid, I think, to, to just chat on telephone lines. It wasn't like it's your phone calls, for example. But, but um, just a, last year, year and a half ago, we hit uh, not just human level now, but now professional transcription level from that data with these neural nets uh, listening to speech. So I say speech recognition that actually works. That's the kind of consumer view. Like, 
It didn't work before. Now it really works. Um, same methods or similar methods were applied to vision, uh, uh, to, a, uh, to an image net challenge problem. Um, and now we actually have reached for a particular one of those uh, um, challenges, also human level accuracy uh, accuracies. And recently, there was a reading challenge. I, I put reading in quotes because I don't want to give people the wrong idea about the understanding of written text. But this is a challenge um, of the form Wikipedia uh, articles uh, are given to a computer um, and a set of questions. And are those questions answered correctly or not? I think a team from Alibaba and Microsoft came in at the top of the list and near human levels of answering those kinds of questions about Wikipedia articles. So again, you can see, you can imagine, even if it's not understanding text like we understand text, you can imagine these kinds of results imply that we can do all sorts of interesting things to build applications with this kind of competency. And then instead of having just single classifiers that do well, um, we've, the community has been building pipelines putting things together, language and vision, for example. Uh, there was a Coco, um, at Microsoft Coco challenge we put together a few years ago. I remember uh, when I was asked by Larry Zitnick um, and Peter Dollar, who were at Microsoft Research at the time, for almost a half million dollars to build a data set. Imagine this data set. You have to sort of get a whole bunch of pictures, um, images, and then have them all segmented and tagged with human captions of various kinds. There's a captioning challenge. We're going to now train up a model and then have a system automatically caption photos in the wild that it, hadn't, that it hasn't seen before. In this case, the, 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 the database was built by taking us a few kids, I forgot how old they were, young children, and have them walk around and just name all the objects they recognized. So was, I think there's about a, about a hundred common objects. And so um, it's the common object, that's the CO in the COCO challenge. But this is what we came out of it, that, that, that having that data set stimulated all sorts of innovative projects and work. Um, and when the results were reported, there were several methods that came out at once when the competition ended. And there, a couple of them were doing quite well. I think Google and Microsoft were quite close and with different scores. One could be said to be winning and so on. But the machine is saying here, this picture, a man doing a trick on a skateboard. Um, the human is saying in purple here, uh, a skateboard is, is. Machines don't make that kind of mistake is, is midair performing a stunt. And so it's really impressive to see these kinds of results. And then we find out that it was easier, easier than we thought. And maybe it's, a, um, it's, it's, a fo it's focused on the actual uh, data set. Uh, might be overfitted. And people talk about, about what this means for the, for the general understanding of, Im of imagery over time. And research is continuing now. So now there's been, been a, a lot of interesting work on looking at video automatically and interpreting by a machine, uh, what the machine is seeing from video, and so on. And I've been really impressed with how fast, just, I would say, I would say just, but these, these classifiers or, or pattern recognizers being more accurate, how that kind, those, kinds of, those kinds of enhancements have been pressed into service. So at Microsoft, for example, uh, just uh, maybe four or five years ago, we were all at the edge of our seats at a conference showing off speech-to-speech -speech translation from, from um, English to Mandarin. Actually, it was in China, in Tianjin. I was there, and we thought it wasn't going to work. And there was a big pause as Rick Rashid was talking. And then it started working. And, and I remember turning around, and one of the Chinese grad students was, was taking her, her translator headphone off her ear with a tear in her eye as it was Rick Rashid's voice speaking in Mandarin. But today, we have Skype Translator and other companies doing very similar things with many languages, speech to speech in this case. Uh, I daily use this Cortana, which is Microsoft's uh, agent uh, feature, um, which here's, here's, here's what my morning looks like. I, I, I boot up my laptop and I see uh, a promise that I made in email that was picked out of my email messages. Um, and it says, you mentioned to the MSR labs directors and four others that you plan to distribute a document this weekend. I go, oh boy, I better do that. <laughs> and how many, in, raise your hand if, you, if you've gotten uh, this kind of uh, concern, if, you, if, if you've been concerned about something you promised somebody here. Uh, I will send you a title and abstract shortly, but half the academics in the room will say, I, I've been there. You know? But in this case, Cortana is identifying my promises and uh, figuring out which ones I'll probably forget 
And it's sort of putting them up for me and, and uh, also trying to give me a, a sense for the timing of when that's most important. So it's daily life. And then, of course, we have these high stakes uh, new capabilities. Um, and I'll get back into this in a few minutes in terms of some of the ethical issues. But even cars now are partly uh, self-driving. Um, and uh, I like some of these things. Always keep your hands on the, on the wheel, pay attention to the road. But this is actually, you know, I, this, I drive one of these Teslas. I've been experimenting with this. I was talking to someone in the audience about sometimes, uh, to, to my own demise. Uh, we'll hear about that later also. Um, and then now there actually are tools available now that you can program to. So Microsoft has cognitive services, other companies. Amazon has something on their cloud services. But in this case, there are tools you can now write software and call services that will, for example, recognize gender and age and emotion, among other things, um, uh, in your software. So I thought today that with that background, I wanted to talk about three kind of aspirations that I think about a lot. And, and maybe we can talk, we'll have some chance to reflect together with questions a little bit later. Attain more general intelligence, master human AI collaboration, and address the influences of AI and people in society. I think all very uh, important areas of, of endeavor, challenge problems, and opportunities for all of us. So let's start with attain more general intelligence. So I'm going to basically make a comment that Herb Simon and Alan Newell, uh, John McCarthy, um, many others, um, Nathan, Nathaniel Rochester, people who wrote that original proposal to uh, for that summer workshop um, that I mentioned earlier, um, would be wholly unimpressed by progress. It's really amazing how slow progress has been in some ways. I think if you look at the proposal that was written in 1955 and then fielded in 1956 to the government for some funding, there was a sense that that summer workshop, you know, that, there'd be some really impressive progress made in the summer of 1956 that just hasn't really even happened yet to this day. We really have created these very, very narrow wedges of intelligence that are almost like savants. Um, they, they don't, it's not clear we have principles of intelligence in the open world. Um, we have no way of really explaining so many mysteries of human intellect to this day standing open questions. And it's not clear that we're closer with the recent work. In fact, I'd like to, to, to look at the advances that we've made as ways to frame questions about what's different about what we should be seeking, potentially, given the successes that we've had. Um, and what's the relationship of these successes to the mysteries of human intellect? So I thought I'd just talk about a few directions that I think are promising. Um, I, I, I have hope that these will, be, will, will lead somewhere, um, and they, they address some interesting um, opportunities. The first is, how, we have to address data scarcity. Yes, we're in the era of big data, but there's not a lot of data about things that machines might need, want to know about. For example, we've had a really hard time imbuing machines with common sense, the common sense of a toddler. Um, We've had a really hard time of, give, of giving systems the ability to generalize, to abstract. We have had a hard time um, uh, addressing the magic of the coordination that we do with all the wisdom that we seem to have and having it be relevant in any moment for um, application to solving a task. One possibility is that we just haven't had enough data to, to build these systems to understand the world as it is. Now, AlphaGo um, and the Alpha work in many game playing projects have made progress because in these games of perfect information, you can have one game play another game and run that trillions of times and, and just record what goes on in the data sets and then do various kinds of, you know, after you see this back and forth minimax kind of search, in this case Monte Carlo tree search, you can collect data and build different kinds of predictive models that you might want to use. At any moment, which, 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 which move is most linked to, a, to the highest probability of a win, for example? What, move, what are the top moves I should do? But we have little 
ability to do this in the open world. And so one approach is, can we build high fidelity simulators and actually put our sensors, like sensors from a drone or a car, into those worlds and gather data in those worlds, but make those worlds high fidelity enough with wind and gravity and magnetic fields and objects. Um, and really, we know how to model sensors, and these worlds will give us ground truth uh, so we can collect large data sets. And so one idea is that we can actually um, run a system, let's say, with a stereo algorithm. Since we know depth, because it's our simulation, we can tag at any moment how far away various objects are in this world. Um, and then build a large data set, and then build, a, in this case, a deep neural network that can predict from a monocular signal what depth is at any moment, and see how well we do, for example. And then use this whole system with its approximations of various kinds to do planning and decision making in that world. It's a promising direction. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but how do, you, how do you map that back to the real world? But you really can't do this at, you know, sort of on the street, you want to train a car with a, a machine learning method called reinforcement learning without getting in big trouble in suburbia. But here's a car uh, that's actually running, you know, in this case, we can run hundreds of millions of trials. Uh, this is in the early days of the runs with an objective function and a value, or a set of, a value function, a set of objectives. And we're trying to figure out how to get this car to do a good job. And I should say that um, <laughs> our team is working with a major auto manufacturer now. So uh, just seeing how, how, how well this, these tools will work for planning the future of, of self-driving cars or support safety-oriented cars that could do a good job helping humans to drive better than this. <laughs> now, we showed how with this method, we could train a drone in this world to do a task like go up to Canada in this remote region of Canada and follow closely electrical power lines and, and, and inspect them to make sure they're all, doing, they're all in good shape without touching them. You can imagine the first few runs also led to some sparking and discharges and destroyed drones. It shows that that person training how well that works. And I just want to sort of celebrate people at Berkeley as well. You know, I always say that the whole idea of simulation-centric AI, where we're now in a crashing wave of this being interesting to people. So Ken, this is Ken Goldberg's team here at, uh, at Berkeley, um, who's used some synthetics or simulation to understand and learn from thousands of virtual objects how to um, uh, pick up, um, grasp objects of different types. And you can imagine if, if you can run a simulation and then do a little bit of learning in the real world, you can really save a lot of time from a robot trying to pick up pieces of plastic or objects or glasses and so on uh, millions of times in the real world. Now another direction I think is very promising is representing the physics of the world in our learning procedures. Here's one example by Tejas Kulkarni, Pushmi Kohli, who was at Microsoft Research at the time, um, of saying, I'm going to actually take a, a learning system, and inside of that learning system, I'm going to put a graphics engine that understands lighting and shading and the rotation of objects in the physical world, as opposed to trying to learn it all from scratch. Right? We're going to, we're going to use a graphics engine in there. And the idea basically is, if you take a, this is a face recognition task, and we're going to put a few faces in from a couple of different poses. You know, maybe I just have head-on views of me, Eric, Eurasia, I have a side view. Now, can the system learn on its own through physics what faces will look like with different illumination, different shading, and, and different poses automatically without having to take pictures from all these angles, for example? This is a general idea of a direction we like to see of physics, the physics of the world being embedded in our learning procedures. Then we get this idea of generalization. And there's, there's um, so many questions about how human beings generalize and how we abstract and how we, we learn a set of tasks and then apply our knowledge to related tasks or even very different tasks by seeing analogies of various kinds or, or homomorphisms or isomorphisms that are very different than what a machine might see um, because it just doesn't know how to generalize. One simple idea that's pretty powerful that I like showing people, because I think it's kind of cute, is, 
I hate to use a knife in any picture here, but there's a knife here. But this shows um, um, uh, is a representation of a, of a multi-layered neural net trained to, uh, for the task of recognizing objects on the ImageNet 1000 challenge, trained with a million photos. So here's a net that took a lot of time. The machine huffed and puffed, set all those parameters right, and now it can see pretty well, I think this one's at almost human level, um, uh, the objects in that challenge set. Now, what people have done is, and this is an MSR project, but others have done this as well, let's take a knife and cut off that top layer that had the final classes of objects in them. And we end up with um, numbers, a big vector comes out there. Instead of being classes, it's a little bit lower down in the network, so it's, it's, it's putting out a vector of numbers, a big vector. Um, and the idea is to say, can we use this, um, this we'll call it a, um, a system without a head <laughs> to, to actually feature, richly featureize images in the world such that now it sort of has a general idea about how to recognize edges and shapes because it was trained on all these objects. And now we're going to customize it for, for use to recognize, for example, um, people in this room. Um, I want to have a smart doorbell running on a very low powered device someday. And in fact, we have a little video here um, that shows how this works. But the idea basically is we, we use a very lightweight classifier, even logistic regression, at the top of this thing, at this network. And we train up the model with specific subsets or sets of, of information we want to discriminate, which has been, been part of the training at all, like rich caruana versus garija, for example. Um, and then run a lightweight classifier that takes all this rich information and uses it, reusing in some ways the, the, the power of what the neural net had come up with when it was told to do the original task. And here's a little video here. Oh, we just filmed this little sped up here, but it shows Rich running a device that has that, that um, modified image net neural net running. Um, the whole thing's running on a tiny, tiny microprocessor. It's all embedded, it's very lightweight. It could be in a doorbell. And he's just training up, he's showing us with, with a couple instances. He can just train it and then run it. And I wanted to show this because it, which actually features one of our, 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 our somebody at the Simons Institute, Garija, who's in the audience here, <laughs> wearing a hat. Uh, and it shows how powerful this can be. Um, so the idea basically is, can we create these new kinds of generalizers that are lightweight, that work pretty well, based on having the, a platform built or a platform result that can be refined very easily with special training. Another area we don't think a lot about that's a very promising area from my point of view is this whole notion of um, thinking about how we coordinate resources. This has been an uh, ongoing area of research in AI with some interesting theoretical results. It, it was framed by the, the, the view of, from Herb Simon originally, of AI systems as being extremely bounded resource decision-making systems in very complicated universes, how should they apply their resources dynamically to the best extent when looking for it to achieve a goal of some kind? So imagine here's a robot, and these are problem instances coming at the robot. Um, there's been interesting work on model-based, very detailed um, decision-making versus model-free or cached information or, or a a learned model. When do you, should a system go and sort of step back and go deep versus use a cached approximation? Related results are when you run a system um, under time constraints, can you do things incrementally that get better and better over time and then stop when you have to or stop when the value of computation, the value of computing goes down? Or if you're looking at many things happening and you're immersed in the open world, which is typically not a single problem world, but a world where results are being streamed to you, um, what are some results about what I should attend to given I have a probability distribution over problems coming next? And we have some, given some assumptions, you can actually say some very, very strong things about a model of computational anxiety what we should be worrying about at any moment when we have some idle time. <laughs> that actually, looking at the results, kind of maps to the way I feel most of the time. I, if, if I, and, 
And when, when it doesn't, I, I think about like, okay, are my assumptions wrong or am I, am I just not an ideal bounded rational agent? <laughs> and in a twist of, of, of uh, expectation, for me at least, it's been fabulous seeing some of the work, and I was part of this kind of research in this area of bounded rationality in the 80s and 90s, and continuing to this day, that psychologists now have taken the ideas from artificial intelligence, from computer science, and they're actually showing, like for example, bounded optimality came from the CS, or CS work, showing these results apply to human beings. And they're formulating their, their projects looking at computational models and theories that came out of AI to people being stressed to see things like being visual search, for example. So that said, um, one of the directions our team has been pursuing, I would call it this, our, the pursuit of integrative AI. Um, the idea here is um, we know we have very narrow wedges of expertise and competency. Can we take a bunch of these areas, like we, we know we, do, we can do machine vision well, we can do speech recognition well, we can do some language understanding. Can we actually build up systems that are pulling together, weaving together multiple competencies, and then by doing that and coming up with a real world setting, look at the problems of coordination and reflection and learning or learning challenges that would make this work better to understand what it might be to build a system that's calling upon multiple competencies as a direction for, as a, as a, a thematic direction for AI research. Now the hint here, or the background here, is that there's a multiple resource theory of mind that psychologists have been looking at for many, many years. And they'll study issues, for example, like can I um, do two things at once and how do human beings trade off um, uh, two visual tasks or vision and speech um, that probe this possibility that we actually, we're not, a, we're not single entities, but we're actually bundles of competency, hopefully, well coordinated uh, when responding to different tasks dynamically. Um, so one of the early projects in this space, I'll just give you a sense for how this research worked, is we actually, with disclosure, filmed the task of receptionists in, at, building, you know, at our research building, and we filmed, we actually videoed both the receptionist face, the faces of people coming and asking for things. We transcribed questions. We watched group forming to get a sense for what would it, what would it take, what kind of competences, competence, competencies would we need to, to actually build um, an artificial receptionist, have some of the same skills. And so it, it was a, an effort in representation and you know, looking at perceptual possibilities and affordances in a machine we can build, what are the inference challenges? Um, this gives you a sense for a timeline of like people um, coming to the desk, for example, and how they will form different clusters and so on. And Dan Bo, who has led this effort, but let me show you the first version of a system we built to try to capture some of these issues. And imagine right now all the competencies that are, that are playing together, I'll call it a symphony of intellect that's been coordinated. Project. That's great. That's I had great. longer oh, hair back then. That's fantastic. Hi, my name is Laura, and today I'm here to help the receptionist with shuttle reservations. What's your name? I'm Dan, and this is Eric. Nice to meet you. Do you need a shuttle? Yes. Which building are you going to? I forget. Where are we going? I think it's building nine. You sure? Yes. So. You're going to nine, right? Yes. And this is for both of you, right? Yes. I'm making a shuttle reservation for building nine for two people. In case you want to correct anything, say or press start over. So, okay. Are you visiting someone? Okay. Yes. So I think I'll, I'll help you register in just a moment. Fabulous. Okay. I think we're set. Okay. Excuse me, sir. Yes? You will be on shuttle 53. It should be here any second. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Hi. Hi. So this led to the work called, called The Assistant, and people that visit me have seen various versions of The Assistant. Hi. Hi, Eric. No one has stopped by to see you since we last talked. And Outlook Mobile Manager is still down, 
So I'm not seeing messages from your email. There's some reflection there about confidence is being lost and so on. Bye-bye. And I love showing this picture because this was somebody who, during this phase of the system, has gotten better since then and has many different dimensions in terms of its domain knowledge, including about 17 years of my comings and goings that have been recorded. So for timing and forecasting and so on, almost better than Sarah Reedon, my human admin knows about my comings and goings. Um, and this young lady came to see me one day. and She'd given me permission to use this video. Uh, she was an intern leaving, wanted to talk before she left. And I thought it was interesting to watch her face up to the system and interact with the system for the first time, being a little nervous outside my door. Hi. Are you here looking for Eric? Yep. Yes. Eric is talking with someone. I can and see that. Take a while. Oh. But I don't think he'd mind a brief interruption right now. Would you like to go now? Okay. You can check back in 15 minutes or so, and we can see if he's available then. Okay. And another option. We could set up an appointment. Would you like me to check his calendar to see if he has any free time later today? Yes. All right. His calendar shows that he's fully booked today. Um, I'm not sure, but I don't think he'll be attending the meeting on his calendar today at 1.30 p.m. I could pencil you like then. No. that work for you? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Great. Would Great. you like me to write this on his calendar? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> okay. Feel free to stop by at that time, but wow. I'm not certain he'll be here. Amazing. Yes, okay. I'll see you later then. Bye. Nice meeting you. <laughs> So I think that there's, there's interesting promise in this direction, but, but progress has been very, very slow. And it um, um, doesn't mean we can't build really interesting, helpful tools. And that's where I'm going next in this area, aspiration of mastering human aid collaboration. Um, there are several directions here. Like how do we build systems that can really extend people, that can augment our intelligence, that can catch errors that we make, and it takes understanding, and these are separate areas of research that come together, models of people and their tasks, models of complementarity, and coordinating initiative. And my, the model in my mind that I like to think about when I think about possibilities is that human beings, their abilities here are on the y-axis, and we can look at our competencies as being almost magical. We're very powerful, but we have systematic blind spots, biases, and gaps in our abilities. And cognitive psychologists have studied these gaps for a, over 100 years. And here's the, the vision, right? Not just in general, like a paper and a pencil helps extend our minds, but could we actually understand these gaps well enough to use machine intellect to extend us where we need it the most? Not replace us, but extend us, right? And there's been work on special pillars of psychology, memory, attention, and judgment, for example. This is a very promising area. It's very exciting to our team. Many of you know that there's some great work in, in psychology, for example, famous work on heuristics and biases. You know, people just don't understand, for example, prior probabilities of outcomes. There's an availability bias, representative bias. These are very well known. You can imagine a machine who, that knows about people's biases might be able to help us in various situations. Even more detailed, there's really great work on uh, issues about multitasking, for example, like that would help us understand the challenge of driving a car while being on the phone. This is actually one of our projects in our group. The attention operating characteristic curve, it really sh gives us a sense for the human trades across people that we make in trying to do two things at once. Our team has done work over the last almost 20 years in attention, memory, and judgment for example, on the upper left-hand side, we built modules that at any moment would compute the cost of interrupting somebody. This is a machine learned model at, at, with, with type of interruption X. What will people forget? What will they remember as landmarks? What will surprise them? For example, a traffic application. Memorability, if you had a model of what you remember, you can imagine a big timeline that would just light up with a, prob with a probabilistic inference the landmarks in your life that help you navigate a, line, a timeline of everything you've done, for example. So you can imagine these kinds of tools can be used in different applications and so on. But more generally, we can think about complementarity 
and start very basic. So there was a chameleon grand challenge in 2016. The challenge was, here's a big data set of negatives and positives. Positives are, in this lymph node tick tissue, it's histology for pathologists to look at, there are signs of metastatic breast cancer. And it turned out that maybe it's good news for pathology. Humans were superior to the best machine learned model. Everyone, I hear a sigh of relief in the 2018, a sigh of relief in the audience. Yes, humans were better. But it turns out the human error was 3.4% and it's false positives and false negatives. But when you combine in a very simple way, the AI system and the expert, the best neural network, you can reduce errors by 85%. So in a simple combination, running both machines together, or the machines, I think, I'm actually sharing, sharing my, uh, my own intuitive insight here about that, my, my bias. Running humans and machines together, you end up with a better uh, combination. But we can do better than that. So as an example, um, AJ Kumar and I looked with, with Severin Hacker, looked at this, this interesting crowdsourcing project, label these galaxies It's part of this project called Zooniverse. And we said, instead of, and it uses lots of people to come online and sort of help become citizen scientists like astronomers and help label galaxies because they're, in the Sloan Sky Survey, there are millions of galaxies that astronomers don't have time to look at. So we said, I wonder if we, if we had a machine vision and humans working together, how well we do. And from a large data set, we learned a, a model, you could call this, this, this is a machine learned model that brings together people's abilities and machines' abilities, looking at the details of the, of the imagery or the features being seen in each galaxy, and someone's history and background, and the current votes coming in from humans to decide how much will it be worth to bring a human being to help here, how many more people should we bring in versus not. And it turns out by doing this well with a whole planner and so on, you Monte Carlo tree search, we showed you can get full accuracy of all the humans working on this for half the human effort and 0.95 accuracy, or 95%, at a quarter of the effort. Where I'm working now with a, with a student, and he just had his, his um, proposal defense just this week, um, is on catching human errors um, in healthcare. Now, there's been various studies in healthcare about preventable errors and outcomes, adverse outcomes in, in medicine. In around 2000, the Institute of Medicine found that about 100,000 people were dying in hospitals because of preventable human error in a report labeled, to err is human. And it is. To have traffic accidents is human as well. There, you know, we can't, people make mistakes. The British Medical Journal published a piece about uh, five years ago that said, no, actually medical error, preventable medical error is, is basically the source of over a quarter of a million deaths per year in hospitals in the US alone. Now this has been disputed and has been back and forth on this, but it's a big number. They put it as a third cause of death after cancer and heart disease. So could AI systems capture like a safety net um, some of these errors and save many, many lives? And I think the answer to that is yes. Here's a simple a model that I want to talk to you about because I think it's, it's, it captures the direction I'd like to see AI go. It's a big opportunity space. Imagine a data set acquired from a hospital, one of the top 10 urban hospitals that we we're working with on the East Coast, of the form, I have a lot of patients over 15 years of data who were discharged from the emergency room. And they came back within 48 hours and they were admitted into the hospital, very sick, with a primary diagnosis that was located nowhere at discharge time on the chart. So I, we, 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 we labeled those kinds of situations as surprises for an expert. So these are not like, help me diagnose this and I kind of know how to do my, it's like, find me cases that surprised expert physicians. And now build a model that when it runs at discharge time, will compute the likelihood that this patient, this one here, will surprise the doctor in some way by some pattern of symptoms that's hiding in the shadows of cognition. So it's, it's by definition, it's running at the frontiers of human knowledge versus trying to replicate people. And that's kind of an interesting direction. And these days, we're pushing this harder into this area of failure to rescue, which is a really sad phrase, which means 
something that happened with this patient in the hospital that could have been treated uh, to stop a cascade towards death was missed. Failure to rescue. And so Day Lee and I, he's a UW student, we have a large database of deaths in the UW system of people who came in for elective procedures. Like, eh, I, I can try that out. And then never left the hospital. Well, didn't leave alive. Um, can we figure out what happened to these patients and why? And could an AI system trained on a lot of data help doctors do a better job? And finally, I just want to mention that beyond this complementarity, there's the, the how. When you mix human and machine intelligence together, what's the mix of initiatives and, and how does that work? And you can imagine this happening in a variety of ways. Um, if we had more time today, I would show some surgical videos showing how a robot works with a human being hand in hand where coordination is critical, timing. But let me just jump to back to my assistant again and show you a, a little bit of a grounding issue here or, or initiative in conversation where conversation psychologists view is, is a collaboration where people make contributions. So what you see here is a trace of the assistant by my door, the latest version, in fact. And it's hard to decode. Um, what you see here are representations of uncertainty in what's being seen, what's being heard, what's being understood, who goes next, and domain knowledge. And Tomas Pesha was an intern with us. We decided, let's take this um, really important set of information and provide it as natural signals to a human being in conversation to help with the collaboration you would have in a, in a conversation. And here's how that works. We're just going to start out without sound, but just watch. This is the latest version of the assistant. So watch what happens as, as they come to my door. But watch your facial expressions very carefully, being all driven algorithmically. Hi there. Are you here looking for Zach? Yes. Are you here for the 2 o'clock meeting with Zach? Sorry, did you say you were here for the two o'clock meeting with Zach? Yes. Is one of you John? Yes. Sorry, I can't tell who is speaking when you stand so close together. Which one of you said there, John? I did. Right. Hi, John. Zach is expecting you. Will you be joining the meeting? So, sorry, will you be joining the meeting? Yes. All right, I've let Zach know you will be joining his meeting with John. I'm sorry. I think Zach is running a little bit late. I'm pretty sure he's on his way. Just to be safe, I'll send him a note to let him know that you're here. Feel free to have a seat while you wait for him. Guess I'll see you later then. Bye-bye. So what I love about this is, um, and it gives me little tingles up my spine, is... It's the, probably the first time we're taking it, all these inferences about multiple uncertainties across perception and knowledge, and we're sharing it out. Those, there's actually entropy signals on across each of these channels. We're sharing it out through facial expressions. Hi there. Oops, in a, in a natural way. Let me um, move on to, to, the, um, to the influences of AI on people in society. I, don't want to, I won't have time to spend to go in, into depth in this area, but I think it's a great way to frame Q&A. Um, and if you, this, this is talking about maybe some of the rough edges we need to get right, as well as potential costs over time, some quite serious. Um, I was amazed that these headlines are just all about two months old. I mean, it, within two months, these headlines have appeared in the press, all addressing diff you know, different distinctions and issues coming up with automation in our midst, rising very quickly. Um, uh, this latest one, interesting, just, just came out last week about you know, sort of algorithmically ads now, are, you know, sort of extremist videos are sucking attention and also sucking ad, ad revenue and so on. Um, and so there are challenges as we bring AI into the open world. And the way I like to think about this is challenges with capabilities of AI systems, their abilities, blind spots and biases, um, issues around values, whose values are represented in the systems in terms of 
the alignment of the objectives of a human being or an enterprise with the system's values, how they're represented. When I say agency, that means who's the decision being made for or who owns the decision. Typically in healthcare, for example, we say the patient, the patient is the principal agent of any medical decision. Misuse. Um, there was recently a story about a, um, of an arrest um, in a country where a facial recognition, facial recognition by report, a facial recognition system was aimed at a large stadium full of people at a rock concert to identify somebody wanted for a crime. These kinds of powers coming to via AI systems are interesting and concerning risks to um, core human rights, freedom of expression, freedom to assemble, freedom to, of speech. Um, there are other kinds of challenges coming to the fore, including privacy, data is the fuel of these systems, various kinds of harms, exclusion, attention, persuasion of systems, algorithm persuasion, for example, about beliefs, for example. And one often unstated principle, when I ask myself, well, why weren't these big concerns 15 years ago when I was a Stanford student or 20 years ago? I think I'm underestimating these numbers actually now. 25 <laughs> years ago. Uh, um, when successes in AI would be new insights about mind, and they'd be new possibilities for service to humanity. And one of the issues that comes to my mind is that because these systems are now quickly brought to scale and they're reusable, we see immediate potential amplification through wide and deep societal influences. So I ha right now in the back of my mind, I see this network showing up, which is, okay, if I build an app, like that medical app that does readmissions, it might go to 1,000 hospitals. So now it's just not, not, not one expert system being used by one doctor, it has, could have major societal implications, or a traffic system that's making recommendations on a wide scale over a city, for example. So we need to think about this moving forward. I just want to mention something about mis misuses. I mentioned a bit, a bit about this, but we have, as I said, human rights violations that are possible, risk of death or serious injury. We've seen that in the press lately with, with automation that, that uh, might, we might do better at. These systems can be um, at the root of the denial of critical resources like loans, um, you know, entry to schools, education, and so on. And they can manipulate attention, beliefs, and, and cognition in a concerning way. Now, I do believe that we all have responsibility, academia, corporations, uh, the, the, the civil society uh, realm to, to focus our attention on these rough edges given how fast these effects and influences are coming into our society. At Microsoft, we created the Ether Committee, which loosely stands for AI Ethics and Effects in Engineering and Research, with seven working groups now, um, including working groups looking very carefully at potential um, human rights issues coming to the fore with Microsoft software and services um, and uses, and making recommendations to senior leadership at Microsoft. Um, Microsoft Corporation, like others, um, has made commitments based on some UN reports and charters, including the core human rights charter. Um, but Microsoft has its own kind of statement about human rights commitments that we want to stick with when it comes to the possible misuse of AI technologies, among other software uses. And then on the community side, um, it's really nice to see, and I've been involved with this, it's been great, great collaboration, to form a nonprofit, uh, multi-party stakeholder group called the Partnership on AI um, that started out as a conversation among researchers at the research labs, we're very, all very good friends over the years, from grad school days and on, at Amazon, Google, DeepMind, Microsoft, Facebook, Apple, and IBM, to say, let's form a nonprofit. Let's invite um, um, 
our colleagues from, from, the, from civil society, academia, um, uh, nonprofit AI research, uh, economics research and service, uh, and foundation work, and build, build a balanced board that balances six seats for the, in this case, founding companies, and six seats for a distribution of nonprofit representatives. And we just brought on, a few months ago, Tara Lyons to be executive director. People might recognize her as being very active during the Obama administration's OSTP efforts on AI. Um, and this group is all about providing a platform for discussions and working groups, developing best practices uh, across industry um, and uh, civil society, um, and, and being a place where people can really discuss and work through some of these rough edges over time. So I want to end by just saying that my dream and my passions are all about number one, largely. I want to understand what's going on with this graph, this tangle of neurons that's Eric Horvitz. I'm fascinated by that. I have some insights that I've managed to accrue over the years, largely from the AI research, even though we don't have a lot to say about this just yet, and we don't. I love the idea of, as a community, working to, to take these results and delivering value to people in society. We need to continue to identify and address costs and ethical issues with new kinds of automation coming to the fore and being amplified by network effects, the web and our connectivity throughout the world now. And it's really important that these collaborations on these issues, both technical and societal, happen widely um, with multiple stakeholders and their inputs and feedback and leadership. So I'll stop there and we'll go to Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was great and uh, inspiring. Now, if you have um, questions, please, please raise your hand. Someone will uh, come with a microphone. And uh, when you have the microphone, you can uh, ask your questions. So uh, this is really big. So thank you very much for the uh, presentation. In fact, it's so big, it, it kind of reminds me of the internet in the 1990s, 20 years ago. Uh, so I've asked people who are experts in this, is this going to be equal in size to the internet, in importance and impact on society? Or is it going to be even bigger than the internet? What's your opinion? It's an interesting question, and uh, the metrics, I have to sort of figure out what the metrics would be in terms of bigger. I impact on society. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I see. OK. Um, boy, that's a, that's a tough one. The, the, the connectivity and um, influence of the internet is so incredible and so deep and so unexpected to me, Go, putting myself in my grad school shoes of somebody using some ex aim dot DARPA, dot ARPA, dot, you know, dot whatever it was in those days, I guess dot ARPA. <laughs> and, um, uh, it depends how it goes, I would say. You know, we might be mostly dealing with classifiers and pattern recognizers for, the, for decades. And, but I came from a meeting this morning with several folks, I won't give away details of this, that we had different opinions on what's going to happen over the next 15 years with these technologies. And if some people at the meeting are correct, the answer to your question is absolutely. I'll leave it there. Yeah. Right here. Microphone. Here it comes. Here it comes. Have you uh, worked with uh, people working on deep voice at all and better um, text to speech because um, the, your assistant is very good at um, processing and understanding, but it's not a great talker. <laughs> um, yes, thanks. A good question. So, so let me just make a comment that we don't have, and it's a great one, we don't have best of a breed in almost any component in that system. So what's the magical part of that research project was there was like, oh, there's probably time to get a better version of X because it's like a six-year-old system before deep deep voice was there and the other competitors and so on. 
Let me just say that I want to celebrate Julia Hirschberg, who was, just became a National Academy of Engineering member last, maybe two years ago now, for this incredible breakthrough work that gave us this kind of voice. To me, that was the big step forward. Now we're doing some spit polish, making it better. But that said, there's something to be really reflected about when it comes to any kind of human-like experience. Because you can imagine AI systems can be quite different. So for example, we built a system called Deep Listener in 2003 that when we fielded it, and it used also, why it was deep is it used lots of contextual signals to understand better what you were saying. But imagine this user interface versus the assistant. It's a little, we scanned in, you know, that HAL 2000 eye, that glass eye from, that, from, the, from the Space Odyssey. We scanned it into the system. I know it's not a great starting point for a great human-compatible human AI system, but there it was on a box. And, it's, and when you talked, it would, it would be green, it would change the color, and if it got confused, it would turn a little bit yellow, and if it got really confused, it would turn red, and you'd, 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 you'd slow down, and you'd start talking more slowly, go yellow, back to green again. So people got used to this eye as being the, the thing you actually talk to, and it's, it's making expressions to you in a very different way, versus me trying, our team trying to do a human-like experience, which then people say, you know, you know, it's kind of creepy. I don't really like the way that human looks or sounds. And so I'm going off to a different direction and saying that it, it might not be the best thing to try to make people like things. Maybe we should stick with these metaphorical scanned in eyeballs and things that might just give us signals and stay away from the, the humanness until we can really get it right completely. And even then it would be kind of Lots of questions would come up. So I hope that's a good answer. Yeah? So one question I have is more of a curious about your comment, and then the other is very specific. Give her a mic. Mic, mic. You're holding back with that mic. <laughs> <laughs> one question I have is uh, more curious about your comment, and then the other is just very specific. The curious about your comment is in the various implications, societal implications. Mm -hmm. I notice you didn't mention anything about um, jobs in terms yeah. of you know, this whole universal basic income thing, if <laughs> people end up vastly unemployed, you know, huge swaths of the population. So that's the sort of broader question. And then the very detailed, specific question is in the thing with the special doorbell, the safety <laughs> conscious person in me was wondering, is the machine able to figure out the difference between a 3D true person versus a 3D person with a photo yes. of someone that is Eric, as opposed yes. to it being Eric. So those are my two. Yeah. So um, I, I underestimated how much content I had. And I don't know if you, you saw me like with a little bit of cognitive overload doing secret skipping of slides uh, forward today, especially on the societal side, which is you know, each, each was balanced about one third, one third. And I ended up giving short shrift to the last part of the talk where I, 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 had, I, I put more effort into those topics. Um, so I'd love to talk to you offline maybe, uh, maybe after about the issue of the economics, AI labor and the economy. You know, I think it's hard to know what's going to happen. Um, I was on a National Academy of Engineering study, actually National Academy of Science study that came out about a year and a half ago after two years of work with experts in labor and work as well as computer scientists trying to figure out where things might go. And the basic conclusion was we needed more data and the Bureau of Labor Statistics and other sources should be providing more data so we can help forecast better. But um, in a, I'll let me recommend people to a great piece to look at. Tom Mitchell and Eric Bialfson, who actually co-chaired that study, just recently, um, about two months, three months ago, put out in Science Magazine in policy forum a piece saying, let's not think about jobs as the grain size. Let's think about what subtasks in an ontology of task types might machine learning accomplish in different decades, machine learning and planning and decision making. And then let's look, then look at jobs separately as what are all the components of a job in terms of the tasks jobs require to, to get done. And then let's imagine if you had these competencies and tasks, how would the jobs as they're currently defined shift or change to be different kinds of jobs based on these competencies? 
versus saying a job is replaced. It's more like, what does a radiologist do if it turns out that the segmentation um, of radiological films or images is pretty easy, but you have to really think through what it all means for the patient and work with the physician ordering the film about the plan. It might shift the nature of a job, for example. That said, I'm uncertain about what's going to happen and whether or not we need to do some dramatic things with taxing and universal incomes and so on. Some people believe they're already planning on this. They say we will need to have that become the way we do the economy in a world that's very, very full of resource from all this wonderful automation and to free people up to do creative artistic things and to become caregivers and all the things we do well as human beings. Uh -oh. Oh, on the, uh, so, yes. Um, so there's, act there's actually uh, a question that's, so the, let me repeat the question. It was, um, I love that doorbell and I'll buy it at Home Depot, but I don't want someone coming up to that thing after it's trained on your face with three images and holding a picture of me up and getting it to my home. It's a great question. Um, so people are looking at this, and so I was just recently at a review at Microsoft Research at a, at a fa tech fair we call TechFest, and this problem was being addressed with heat patterns and 3D analyses, and we showed, you know, pictures wouldn't do it, but the human being would. I think we'd have, we'd have to sort of work through the security model there, make sure it really does the right biometrics. Because um, it could be a human being, and you have the heat and everything, but then it's fully made. It's so now, now it's the human with the, this is an adversarial <laughs> attack here. Well, the human wearing the mask, right? Well, right, <laughs> Yeah, 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 it's great. I mean, Contoured. yeah, I could have given other examples, I guess, for the, the doorbell, I guess, is a little scary. Um, but, <laughs> but, but, but no, but I think it's, these are good questions, and we have to always ask these questions with all these methods, right? Because, you know, as, as with any technology, we put things out, uh, and then uh, unexpected or inadvertent things can happen. Even the, um, that readmissions manager, 30-day readmissions, right? So, okay, well... We, we realized early on, um, somebody called us actually from one of, the, one of the hospitals, and they said, have you ever thought about what happens when patients are touched by your system and there's a decision made by the actual machine learned filter that changes the care for a patient? And over time, that system running in a population will change the distribution of sickness and wellness. And if the model doesn't correct for it, it's not modeling its own effects. So in general, we want to think deeply about inadvertent and, law and, and bigger effects than we actually maybe think about at the first pass in the laboratory. Same with traffic, you know, like people always ask, well, if Google Maps or Bing Maps says go here because it's open, what does that mean when everyone goes there? I mean, we have these interesting issues we don't think deeply about sometimes as, as a community. I have a question. Yeah, a lot of questions. And I'll come back to you in, in just a minute. Any of another question? Yeah. Can I ask you after? Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, can you comment on how much better an AI may need to be than humans in order to be acceptable to humans? So uh, some of the examples, even the, the self-driving cars, the error rate's probably way lower with the self-driving car than it is for a human. Yeah. But any example of a negative result is sort of outweighed by humans. Uh, and so how much better do you think it may need to be? And I know this yeah. is probably sort of use case dependent in some ways, yeah. right? And, uh, and it's a discussion point we can have at, over coffee too after, the, I guess after the, the formal session here. I think it is dependent. I think, as an example, society will not tolerate bizarre, non-human style crashes of cars, even if their global use will nearly eliminate all 36,000 deaths or so in this country per year and many more thousands of injuries that are lifelong injuries with lifelong implications, we will not tolerate it. I, I just think we won't um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a community, even with arguments like that. And, and these sound like Elon Musk's uh, tweets about the accidents where he comes back and says, look, the, it's making everything much safer. And he's, he's actually correct. But uh, uh, speaking as somebody who actually suffered an accident, <laughs> and there's a whole section of my talk that I would could spend on this, uh, on autopilot, um, that I was luckily uh, safe from injury on. Uh, on. Um, I believe that we could do a lot better 
on many fronts with safety and reliability of AI systems, more globally, um, that will raise the bar on um, what we should expect in terms of reliability and trustworthiness, um, and lower concerns in general. I'm hopeful there. Yeah. You didn't have time to go into it, but could you say a few words about um, AI in surgery? Yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's a broad area. I'm on the advisory board of, for CS at Johns Hopkins. You could imagine a place like Johns Hopkins, CS department, we have lots of robotic surgery uh, as, a, as a topic. It's that they're, they're, they're well known for surgical uh, excellence at that school. Greg Hager is a, is a leader there in that work. It's really impressive work um, as to what's possible, especially now with the popularity of the Da Vinci system and other systems like that where there's a robotic linkage already being used, but it's driven, by, it's driven typically in manual mode, even though it's a fabulous set of tools for steadying the hand and so on, uh, and for going through and doing open style surgery through laparoscope, lap laparoscopic um, entry points. Um, but you can imagine um, all sorts of interesting work. There's a, I have a video I was going to show if I had time today of some work done showing humans working with a machine at, a pedi at the pediatric hospital in Washington, D.C. on a very complicated repair called anastomosis repair. It's kind of when you take two tubes like intestine and put them together. And showing how much better the machine is at stitching than a human would be. And so you can imagine there's all sorts of interesting possibilities. An interesting direction at Johns Hopkins, by the way, is using AI systems to automatically understand and recognize the grammar of surgery um, to help with this idea of the mixed initiative, to know when surgeons are doing X and Y to happen next and have this hand back and forth, this volley of contributions. But secondly, to understand expertise, to recognize expert versus non-expert surgeons and figure out what's different and help with training surgeons. It's a really interesting area. The most exciting recent work is, uh, and Greg Hager is the lead on this, H-A-G-E-R, I'm going to look up his research and the team, is using deep neural networks in the open world, just videos right at the, at, during surgery to, to segment and figure out what's going on and to start doing coding and labeling and tracking for education purposes as well as quality management. Uh, should I? Um, sure. I mean, I, I want to. Uh, yeah. So I, I have uh, a question a bit related to uh, what uh, you've just uh, talked about. So uh, we have all these uh, uh, algorithms that uh, are pretty soon or already taking some decisions, uh, like uh, classifiers or decision takers, yes. deep neural, neural networks. And uh, basically, we have some data, we train them, and we get the result. But often, we don't know how this result was actually achieved. And when people uh, start uh, getting decisions that uh, their lives depend on it, like you, you, you ask for a loan for a bank, and he uh, types your name in, and an algorithm says, no, this, this guy is not allowed to get a loan. Uh, so you want to know why. So the question, is there any research that allows you to actually uh, people to understand because people start demanding explanations like if, if the banker says it you can talk to him you can <laughs> kind of reason with him but if you just type into algorithm and there is deep net neural network which trained on who knows what you, you'll demand explanations so how this explanation would be provided well, well the, 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 there's good news and bad news about this right the, the good news is that it's a rising uh, field of study, um, as well as uh, an area being somewhat pushed along and pressured by some regulations. A famous one is called GDPR, coming from Europe. I think it's May 25th. It's going into force, uh, if I got that right. Um, that actually asks somewhere in one of the articles, I've got the number of the article, I used to know the number when I gave a talk on this, that people who um, uh, are touched by, by consequential decisions, automated decisions made by an automatic reasoning system, deserve to understand in a meaningful way the logic of the processing. It's actually, this is actually a regulation. The problem is that it's like neural network that's no logic. Well, so that's, that's, that's the, the bad news is it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
in general. Um, you know, in 1986, I wrote a paper looking at a decision theoretic system um, that was confusing uh, doctors when it asked, recommended the next, next question to ask. And I said, no, 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 this is, it's really, it's really, it's, it's, it's trust me, it's, it's, it's doing value of information computations. Expected value, it's, it's, it's got to be right looking at these diseases it's trying to rule out and so on. And then I realized that it was so good at what it was doing, it thought in a very non-human way, jumping way ahead, and doctors actually preferred to have it slow down into these classes like benign malignant weighted by the probabilities. We wrote a paper called, you know, this trade between optimality and transparency so doctors are more comfortable using the system and can learn from it. And in, in those days, it was kind of a wacky idea, like, oh, huh, understandability of an expert system that does decision theory, that's interesting. But going back earlier, explanation was central, believe it or not, in the expert systems era, the rule-based expert systems days. And there were actual tutorials and papers being written. Randy Teach did a, a paper on this topic that doctors needed to understand. But it was much easier explaining a chain of rules. Now we're in the statistical world, and so it's, we're faced with very interesting challenges. And there's interesting work going on, local explanations, building models that are sums and sums of, of components, even if they don't perform as well as a neural net as the explanation, source of explanations. And then people are looking at, you know, what can you do with neural nets? Sensitivity analyses, counterfactuals. It's a very wide open area. We don't even really understand what would be a satisfying explanation to a human being. It's a psychology there as well. Uh, you just talked about GDPR, and I was wondering if you could address uh, more generally what you see as the proactive role of the government, both federal in terms of funding and infrastructure um, for basic research, down to state and local in terms of regulations, privacy, et cetera. Um, I know it's a kind of small question, especially in, in, uh, looking at other countries like China that have taken a really proactive stance in trying to work with companies, whereas the United States were more um, letting the private sector drive. I mean, what do you see as the proactive role that government should or should not be playing here? So, I, so my current leaning is, so some people that are worried about concepts like, and use phrases like artificial general intelligence as a thing um, that's going to be snapped into by, or discovered, and then we're in big trouble if we don't get things right, um, or just concerned about really powerful AI systems being controlled by small numbers of people, um, or surveillance, sometimes like surveillance, think about broadly about like having like, we need to regulate AI. To me, it's like, that sounds to me like, we need to regulate computer science. Because AI is a very broad set of disciplines. It's not, it's not a blue-green gas that comes out of the vent somewhere, right? And, um, and if, you read the, if you read press articles, you'll think it's like some material that's being discovered, like it's some, some, like some sort of radioactive material. But it's actually, literally, it's optimization, it's planning, it's, it's, it's statistics. And so regulating that globally is, is funny to me. However, specific applications in domains, like transportation, um, to me make a lot of sense and might be very important in certain areas. Um, so I believe that, I'd have to think more about this, I don't want to make a, a statement, I'm not being videoed here. I believe it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's likely going to be the case that when a safety critical system is fielded, let's say an automated car, that it's looked at very carefully in terms of how data is collected, how accidents are reported, just like for airplanes right now. Um, it's probably going to be the case that when you field the system in the open world, given the nuances of AI systems, um, you'll need to have a kind of a phasing, phase one clinical trial, phase two clinical trial, post-marketing surveillance with reporting of adverse effects. If I had a rash from a drug, it'd be reported by the, you know, in the air system for the FDA. You know, um, when I had, I'll say this on tape now, I had my Tesla accident, what happened was, I was driving along on a curving road that I had been on many times um, in autopilot on this day for stochastics, uncertainties, nuances of sunlight, whatever it might be. The left and right tire, when it came through an intersection, hit the yellow line on the left side. But the yellow line was a raised, painted, nine-inch high piece of concrete. And so it blew up both tires and took out the rear suspension of the car. And I thought, wow, um, it pulled over. 
and I called Tesla, and they said, well, you know, you weren't on a highway, and you weren't going more than 45 miles an hour, so we're not responsible. Um, <laughs> here's the towing company number, and they'll take care of you at roadside service. Uh, but I really wanted to report my case. I wanted to report the experience. I wanted to push a button that say, look, I hope you're tracking this, because here's what happened. Uh, I had eyes and ears on this thing, and I can, and, and then just a month and a half ago, and I feel ethically challenged here, someone was killed in Mountain View. And my view of that accident, reading the New York Times article very carefully, was that's sort of the accident that I had, but the block was a bit higher. It was a piece of, it was, a, it was actually a, a divider that was higher on 101, not this low thing on 85th Street near 130th Avenue. And so if there was a collection, a way to collect this information and share it, and if it had to be regulated to have it happen, I say, sounds like a good idea. I want to think about it some more. But I can see things like that, domain-specific uses and applications, especially in fielding technologies in the open world. Uh, Ava. So I want to follow up from, I guess, one question back on explanations. So one interesting thing you touched on, but I guess I hope you have more, maybe you can respond more about, is there human biases um, and these learning systems often learn from human experience. Yeah. So that means the learning system is encoding <laughs> our biases. Yes. And sometimes these human assisted systems are actually amplifying our biases rather than helping them. Yes. So what do you think we should do to turn this around and well, It's a major help? concern. And there's a whole conference now that, that's, that well, 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 accountability and transparency are considered as important. It's the fairness that's the dominating concept now. Can we build fair systems? Uh, it's a really beautiful area of research in terms of what, what, what's a metric for fairness, what are protected variables, what's legally OK, what's, um, how do we detect that there's bias in systems over, even over time through um, the dynamics of the, of the world. But certainly, um, we are definitely in a situation where uh, vicious circles can be algorithmic. And um, we are challenged when it comes to even applic applications like public safety, right? policing. Um, we know for, and there are studies at ACLU and other, other civil liberties groups, that we have all sorts of challenges with how we orient ourselves to data sets and how are they collected. Well, you know, there was more observations of this part of town. And since the police were looking over here more, they kind of confirmed that there are problems in this part of town. So we'll put more police there, more observations, get more data about this part versus that side of the tracks. And you can imagine this goes into issues of gender uh, and race, um, other, other dimensions of, of demographics. Um, there are so many deep biases in our society. You know, my wife, well, she likes to say my partner, often points out that even in this, I think, and I could check this again on video here, like even in the 60s apparently, in the United States, women had to get the permission of their husbands to even have a charge card. So you're telling me we don't have biases in our society a few years later? It's deep, and race in particular too, very deep. So um, we have a group in the Ether Committee just focused on fairness and bias from Microsoft's point of view, and it's a central focus of the partnership on AI as well. And of course, there's a conference, well, there's a conference now called Fat Splat. Uh, it used to be called Fat ML, Fairness, Accountable, and Transparent Machine Learning. And the group was rightly so figured out that it's not just ML, it's other algorithms as well. So now it became fat asterisk. And I heard from Hannah Wallach, we might want to put it that's a fat splat is the new name for the conference. But it's in its, it was in its first year this year as a formal conference, but it's been like three workshops to now. So it's an active area. It's a very good comment. Um, it's a really big danger with these systems. That network effect appears again. It shows, it pokes through the, the slide, and I, I think about the, the network effects and the possible vicious circle. Yeah? Well, we are out of time with the. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> These are great questions, by the way. <laughs> last question? Okay, last question. Okay, good. Here you go. It seems to me that 
unless you believe there's something divine or metaphysical going on in the neural network of our minds. I don't. Nor do I. That eventually, and maybe sooner than I personally might like, you'll be able to, in fact, replicate every human capability intellectually. I think it's somewhat ingenuous when you say, well, people will get different jobs if you're talking about receptionists. The question I have for you, I guess, is how long will it, assuming that we both agree that you'll be able to do everything that humans can do, how long will it be before you are obsolete and the people in this room that do what you do? And should we, be, should we not be concerned about, not you particularly, but what do people do when they're all obsolete? So I'm so glad you asked this question as the last question today. Um, I, um, my, hope, my hope is, and my belief, is that the power and need of human beings for human beings will only get stronger in a world full of automation and automated intellect. And I foresee, and maybe this is optimistic, the rise of what I like to call a caring economy, where there's a lot of wealth around from the automation, but the top compensated people are the best at providing human touch, human connection, human teaching, pedagogy. Um, and, and it's just, a, it's just the, 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 the optimistic view that it might go very well for humanity. If you don't think those things can be modeled too, if everything can be modeled, why can't those be? Let me just make a comment again. Um, and I'll end with this example, and then we can talk out, out, out in, the, in the atrium, in, in, the, in the lobby. Um, there's a, we had, again, at, at, a, at, a, at a deep dive with our senior leadership team at Microsoft, we looked at a, a, a set of future projects. And one of the projects coming out of our China lab, MSR Asia, was a system that could write a beautiful song to a deep neural network. It, it looks at songs and poetry in China. And it, it writes a beautiful song with lyrics, all novel. And people said, I, I, actually, by the way, I just got a book, Book of Poems by Xiao Ice, that I have at home now. And I said, wow, it's like, you know, it's like people say they have, you know, I, didn't, I don't understand Mandarin, but people have tears in their eyes listening to these songs. I said, you know what? When I hear a song sung by a country Western artist, I want a human being who experienced those lyrics. And I'll pay top dollar for that. Now let's end there. Thanks, Thanks very much, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.